the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. You shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, lift your praise. And we were the beggars, yeah. Now we're royalty, and we were the prisoners. It's good to see you guys. Is this thing on? Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> good morning. Can you guys hear me? Good morning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's good to see all you guys. to the
faces waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted graces waiting where the spirit Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will fall, prison shake. Lord, we thank you for just bringing us into this space where chains break, where we get to be free in you, free in Christ. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and then raising again so we can raise with him and be free with him and reign in heaven with you. We love you. Amen.
just give them a big round of applause? Come on. That's awesome. I would love for all of us right now to pray over our seniors. So if there's a senior in this room, could you guys please stand up, whether you're graduating from high school or college? Anyone? We'll pray over you. Oh, right here, okay. Um, well, we can all bow our heads and um, just lift your hand if there's someone around you towards that senior. Um, and yeah, let's pray for them. Father, we thank you for just the way you watch over your children um, in the big moments and the little moments. Um, you have your thumbprint. You have, uh, you're just watching over every single one of these seniors that are being commissioned and being sent out and, and stepping into the real world or stepping into the college world. Um, Father, they're gonna be faced with new challenges, a new season of life that um, can bring so many new barriers. And so we just ask that as they step out into the fire, as they step out um, into the unknown, Father, you are just watching over them and you are guiding them and you are growing them into children of God, children who know they are loved by their Father. So just guide them and send them out, Father, and keep your thumbprint over their lives. We love you and we thank you for this so much. Amen. Some might say I'm using this as a walker. <laughs> and uh, the entertaining part is that, uh, <clears throat> oh boy. There we come. James, I might have to buy a vowel here because uh, this is your last slide up here now unless I can tell people to move it myself. I had tech issues in the first service too. There we go. Yep, take the rest of the day off. Well done. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's entertaining. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm getting my second hip replaced uh, Tuesday. So I go upstairs pretty good. I go down really poorly. So uh, this was nice here. It's like a grocery cart. You know, I can lean on this sucker while I'm rolling around here. I'm John Mazinski. For those of you that don't know or those of you that are watching online, I'm one of the pastoral interns here at St. Mark's. And uh, I'm really blessed to follow Alice in this sermon series on Galatians. And for those of you who missed it, or God forbid last week slept through it, um, she opened with astonishment. And so go back and check it out online uh, if you missed it. It was a real firecracker. It was eye-opening. It was heart-changing. And today in Galatians 3, we're going to talk about how God creates a new multi-ethnic family. <laughs> uh, how we're all children of God. And we're going to talk about the, uh, this Galatians chapter 3. So I guess I should start. We're going to read through it. Now, it's long, and there's a lot going on here. And you're going to say, what? And your head's going to be spinning. But I'm going to bring it all back together for you. Or you can cut my pay in half. How's that sound? So Galatians 3, 15 through 29. It's a longer reading than last week. But I tell you, there's some nuggets in here, and it's really worth it. So brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises that were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to his seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. So what I mean is this, the law, which was introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in His grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. So why then was the law given at all? It was added because of the transgressions until the seed to whom this promise refers to had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one person, but God is one. 
Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would have certainly come by the law. But Scripture had locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Christ Jesus, might be given to those who believe. And before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up, until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. And now that this faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God. Through faith, for all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor are there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to that promise. Today, Galatians 3, we're going to talk about this new multi-ethnic family. Everybody gets in how we're all children of God. But, I mean, what's all this talk about Abraham? Um, 430 years? Inheritance? Law? Children of God. Um, What does this all mean, and what does it all mean to me? So let me go back just one step to chapter 2. Abraham, we talk about being declared righteous by his faith in God's promise. Promise. So why did we introduce these laws of the Torah anyway? What are they good for? Paul says, he's relating part of a conversation he has with Peter back in Jerusalem, and he says, we know that a person is not justified by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, nobody Nobody is justified. Now, Paul's not, I'll say, deprecating or putting down the law, for he clearly maintains that God's law is holy, it's righteous, it's good. But he's arguing against this illegitimate use of the Old Testament law that made observance of the law grounds for acceptance by God. Alice mentioned the Judaizers last week. And their big push was gospel plus. If you, needed, if you wanted to be a new Christian, you had to be, you know, first a Jew, but you also had to be circumcised to believe and be a, a believer in Christ. The big plus, to obey that rule of the law of Moses, like the Jews were doing, and to be circumcised. So how is anybody ever considered righteous under the law? How does anybody get righteous in God's eyes? When Jews like Peter or Paul put their faith in Christ Jesus, it clearly implies that their law, obedience, or observance was not sufficient. So what's Paul talking about in Galatians 3? And how does he know all this stuff? Remember, in Acts, Paul's introduced to us, he's a Pharisee. He is the student of a famous rabbi in Jerusalem. In fact, Paul's a Pharisee's Pharisee. He knows all the rules. He has read all the books. He is going after people of the way, the new Christians, in Acts chapter 8. But now, in chapter 9, he meets the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. And he's a disciple, and he's preaching the gospel of Jesus' death and his resurrection to the Galatians. So this everyday life. Paul talks about a human covenant that might be something like, say, a last will or testament. You can't change that after the person dies, okay? The last one he or she wrote is what sticks, okay? If it's been written down and that person is gone, that's the, that's the deal, okay? That's the covenant. And Scripture is commonly used to talk about covenants that God makes with His people. And so Paul thinks that God's covenant with Abraham, His promise, he insists it can't be set aside by a later law, that law of Moses. Huh? 
Let's go back to chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, the very first book of the Bible where God enters into a covenant with Abraham. Abraham is declared righteous because of his faith in the promise that God has given him. God promises Abraham three things. He promises descendants. He promises him descendants. And this is a heck of a miracle, folks, and I'm coming to it. He promises Abraham the holy land, the promised land. And he promises that Abraham and his offspring will be a blessing to all the nations of the world. Now, Abraham's old. <laughs> he's at least 75 when God hits him the first time, and he's probably close to 100 by the time this story comes around in a couple years later, or a couple chapters in Genesis. His wife Sarah has borne him no children. And by this time, she's close to 90, well past the age of childbearing. She's, she's barren. And yet God says through an angel of the Lord, is anything too hard for God? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Genesis 18, 14. Now let's not forget those other two things, okay? His people will eventually inherit the land, and all the nations will be blessed by you and your offspring. That's why... Right at the very start of the New Testament, Matthew's gospel, Matthew's genealogy, it goes all the way back to Abraham. We're talking Abraham. So he reminds, Matthew does, all the Jewish listeners why this is. There's one-way covenant. There's a one-way covenant from God to Abraham. There's no mediator involved. Abraham is declared righteous for his faith in this promise. And now the law comes along after the people have been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. The law of the Torah. The Torah is just a name for the first five books of the Bible. You know, all you kids that go here Wednesday nights, and, and I struggled with this till I was in my 40s, but, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those first five books. And there's not just those Ten Commandments that Moses walks down the mountain with, but there's 613 laws 613 rules for life in those first five books of the Bible. And why did we need those? It's not just a one-way covenant with God to the people, but it's a two-way covenant. God says there'll be blessings. If you follow the rules, you'll keep the land. You'll truly be blessed. But if you fail to follow the rules, uh, here comes some curses. Now, why did they need this second covenant anyway? I mean, why, why this additional stuff? Well, they had just come out of hundreds of years of slavery. They didn't know how to live in community. They didn't know how to live with each other. They didn't know how to be... Well, think of a nanny who takes care of kids until they grow up. This was an interim measure, a temporary fix, intended to last only until the coming of Christ. The seed promised... To Abraham. So, is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of Christ? Excuse me, the promises of God? Absolutely not, says Paul. It's a good thing, too, or it'd blow our whole summer sermon series here, okay? We're coming right back with some law this summer. But, the Scriptures declare that the whole purpose, ah, descendants, promised land, all nations blessed. No, the scriptures declare that the whole world is a prisoner of sin by this law, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Some interpreters read this as faith in Jesus Christ. Some read it as the faithfulness of Jesus Christ himself. And now that our faith in Jesus or his faithfulness has come, we're no longer under this supervision of the law. We don't need to be guarded by it. We don't need our nanny anymore. Back in Paul's day, this was like a guardian. It was a slave that was charged to the watch over a young man until he reached the age of maturity. And Paul sees this Mosaic law as kind of a, a secondary, a, a, an interim measure, if you will. I mean... I, who could follow all 613 of these rules? 
all day, every day, 24-7. Not I, not you, not you, certainly not you, and, and not you. I couldn't do it. The law says stay in line until the offspring comes. And this giving of the law leads to slavery under sin. And the law serves to reveal our sin to us. And it alienates God from man. But it serves to show our need for salvation that the promise offers, because we can't do it ourselves. And speaking of Old Testament covenants, there's just one more big one out there. This is a one-way covenant from King David. God says to David, The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So who's God's talking about now? Yeah, on a Sunday morning, the answer is typically Jesus. He rises. He sits at the right hand of God. He sits on the throne of God. His kingdom is established forever. He takes the curse of Israel's sin upon himself. So in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew, there's neither Gentile, there's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female, we're all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to this promise. In Christ Jesus, we're all equally embraced. We're all on the same terms. We're Abraham's true spiritual descendants. We're spiritually baptized. We're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We're united with Christ as part of his body. Now, you guys saw a baptism last week here at the 10 o'clock service. And Alice always includes some words about the covenant relationship we enter into at baptism. And it's part of why I say when children come up to me for communion, I put a hand on their shoulder and say, may the Lord bless you and keep you in your baptismal covenant. And what does that mean? Let me repeat some of the words that Alice used in her baptism last week. In baptism, we're passive. It's something we submit to. It's a rule that is done by another. It's a dynamic action of faith by which we helplessly present ourselves to the Holy Spirit for God's acceptance through the cross and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Baptism is where the Holy Spirit lays hold of us and declares that we're included in the covenant and joined with Christ. He's saying, this one is mine. This comes right out of Isaiah 43.1, and we put it on all our baptismal banners, and I have called you Tom. I've called you Jane. I've called you Harry. I've called you Barb. You. You. You are mine. So let's tie all this up. Verse, verse 16 out of this reading, it says the promises are spoken to Abraham, and it's, and it's his seed, clear back to the very first book of the Bible. And verse 29 at the end of this reading says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we too put our faith in Jesus Christ. We're justified by faith in Christ and not by the works that we do, the works of the law. Now, many people can know or recite, you know, you see these John 3.16 signs all the time at football games or a guy on a street corner. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life together. And one verse in our reading today ties the whole Bible his story, history, all together. I think Galatians 3.17 is Paul's best line in all of his 13 books in the New Testament. What I mean is this. 
The law introduced to you 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. The law is secondary, it's inferior, it's temporary. It's a disciplinary arrangement for teenagers or those of us that sometimes still act like teenagers. God's promise to Abraham that all nations will be blessed through you and your offspring means that you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and all you over here are all those who are Christ's people. They're Abraham's seed. They're inheritors of that same free, gracious gift to Abraham. Amen. Let us pray. God, thank you for sending us your son. There's no way that we could live up to all the expectations that were handed down to us by Moses, that mediator. We thank you for the gift that you gave Abraham, that you recognized his faith in your promise. Lord, we ask that you do the same for us, to know that we are all children of God, to know that we are all your people, to know that we are in your service in this time and place to serve and to love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can stand and worship with us.
the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Thank you guys for joining us. Go now in peace, connecting your faith and life. We'll see you guys next week.